We start the chapter with Ness and Kaiser being surprised by everything that has happened in the previous chapter, where Hiori and Isagi completely cooked them. If you're a frequent visitor of my channel, consider subscribing. Igaguri and Corona are very happy. The game's hero is Isagi Yoichi. As Isagi's shot smashes into the back of the net, the world erupts as they witness the hero who conquered the chaos and established himself as the game's hero. Despite all of this, Noel Noah still has this serious look on his face, and even though Ubers has lost, Mark Snuffy is smiling. And here we see that Gagamaru is celebrating Aswell. As the score gets confirmed, we get a closer look to Isagi and Hiori's celebration, as Corona and Igaguri run up the field to celebrate with them. Oliver Aiku sits defeated on the ground while being very impressed about Isagi and Hiori. Nico Iki doesn't really get what's up with those two either. Oliver Aiku responds with saying that they're twisted. Nico still just can't believe it. Well, theoretically at least. He can't believe it because for this to work, those two have her to sync up without even making eye contact, he says, as he stares to the bastard Munchen players celebrating. Nico says that such a feat is impossible unless those two have synced up perfectly with each other. Their thought process and the things they saw on the field. Everything needed to be in sync. As we see Corona, Hiori, Isagi, Raichi, and Gagamaru celebrating, Lorenzo says that they've got destroyed by those two and that attack would have surprised any perfect design that they could have created. Sharing a winning vision that surpasses logic and theory, it was a risky gamble. But for them to pull it off in this do-or-die situation, you gotta tip your cap off to those crazies. They were the heroes of this match. Wow, Lorenzo is such a nice person, to be honest. Getting recognition from him must be really nice. He says that the gold just now was worth 100 million yen. Baru Shue looks very frustrated with the situation as well as you would expect. But I'd wish we'd gotten more dialogue from him. Ness is just standing there in awe, unable to process what actually just happened. He's realized that they didn't make eye contact either, and that there's no way that they could be syncing up like that. He finds such a chemical reaction disgusting, but obviously Kaiser's pet dog is coping like crazy. But is that the There's essence, the magic of Yoichi's football? Kaiser is walking past him in the background, and now the guy is completely snapped as he goes into his Super Saiyan 2 transformation. That guy's rage and incomprehensible but truly deserved. Kaiser has been completely defeated. Isagi and Hiori give each other an high five in the process of all of this. Isagi tells Hiori that he's amazing as expected of his buddy. He says that his shot gave him inspiration. If they'd use his shot as a decoy, they could create a split-second opening. If they had complete trust in one another, that is, though. He's thought that they would see the same winning vision. So Isagi thanks Hiori for tagging along with his selfish demands. Hiori tells Isagi that he has never thought that he could use expectations like that. He says that it won't work even if both parties understand and play off each other. And it's not even about one person wholeheartedly supporting the demands of the other individual either. This partnership can only work if both parties believe that the other person sees the same winning vision. When I realized that he could play freely, a whole new world had opened before Hiori's eyes. So he thanks Isagi for that. Isagi tells Hiori to do this until they'd become the best playing in the world. But Hiori refuses. He tells Isagi that he won't be playing this kind of tag team football with him anymore, but instead, from now on, he's going to play a brand of football that will produce the best striker in the world. Artless playing with Isagi has truly ignited his passion for football. He tells Isagi that he was actually planning on quitting after this match, but after being part of that goal, after experiencing that thrill and that ego, there's no possible way that he can quit. If strikers can't understand and keep up with his passes, he'll discard them without a second thought. And he tells Isagi that it applies to him as well. Isagi tells Hiori that contrary to his calm demeanor, he's actually quite a sadist. Hiori doesn't really get what he's talking about though, because he's actually an ultra sadist. From now on, his life will revolve around him. Game five of the Neo Egoist League is finally over as we get those wholesome moment where Asagi jumps on Hiori's back. But wait, this is not over yet, as we get to see the events from the PXG match against Manshine City. The score is two on one as Itoshi Rin and Nagi Seishiro are duking it out for the loose ball. It looks like Itoshi Rin is in some half berserker mode or something. Rin manages to trap the ball, 
Chigiri doesn't believe it, and Ryo asks Nagi to stop him. Nagi responds with saying that this Rin guy is a freaking monster. His core strength, body balance, trapping, dribbling, shooting. This bastard, all his specs have evolved beyond comprehension. As he curved the ball towards the left corner, it goes past the goalkeeper, and he scores the winning goal for PXG. The guy has literally scored a hat-trick. The one goal on Manshine's side was from Chigiri. As the world leaps at Isagi's game-winning goal, around the same time in another part of Blue Lock, a familiar striker quietly bags a hat-trick with a three-on-one victory over the Manshine City team. The evolved Rin has single-handedly destroyed Manshine City, with his next target being Isagi Yoichi. The fateful showdown between these two rivals is coming soon. Rin tells Isagi to prepare himself and that he's going to completely destroy him. Nagi Seishiro falls to the ground as Itoshi Rin wraps up his spectacular performance with an insane hat trick. And with that, PXG steamrolls Manshine City 3-1, to or rather, Itoshi Rin has steamrolled them. Even the genius Nagi Seishiro didn't stand a chance against the monster that Itoshi Rin has become. Destroying all that dares to stand in his way, the monster sets his sights on his next target, which is Isagi Yoichi. In the next panel, Nagi tells Itoshi Rin that he keeps on getting stronger and stronger, which is amazing. So he asks him just what it is that drives him to become even stronger. Itoshi Rin doesn't get it, as Nagi should already know it at this point. It's, of course, to surpass Itoshi Sai and to destroy Isagi Yoichi. So Nagi asks him an interesting question here, which is what happens when he accomplishes everything he desires. What will you do then, as he's still lying on the ground while laying all this as expected from the lazy genius? Rin tells him that he doesn't care. He gives an interesting example of his question, which is, what kind of baby thinks about dying when they're immediately born? Once we are born, there's only one thing to do, which is survival. It doesn't matter if there is a heaven or a hell. In his football fantasy, Rin dictates everything, just like all those who stand before him with a lukewarm attitude. He will send them straight to hell. Man, Itoshi Rin is as cold as ever, as expected of the one whose heart has got destroyed because of Itoshi Sei. We go back to the bastard Munchen Stratum now as we see the score and everything. The first goal from bastard Munchen was from Isagi through his lefty shot. The second one was from Kaiser's bicycle kick. And the third one was from Isagi's direct shot. And the two goals were from King Baru himself. But anyway, Isagi remembers what Kaiser told him now when he proposed the challenge to him, which is to see who can score the most goals. And Isagi has won it. In this match with his bet with Kaiser, he has truly surpassed the Naked King as he is celebrating his victory not only over Ubers but this time specifically over Michael Kaiser. Now the announcer suddenly starts talking as the bastard Munchen players start staring towards the announcer. The announcer tells the egoists to pay attention and that both match 5 and match 6 of the Neo Egoist League have been finished. So, with that in addition to broadcasting, we will bring the results to everyone simultaneously. They will now move on to the auction rankings. Here it comes, says Raichi, while Yukimiya Kenyu does look a bit concerned. So the announcer continues with saying that currently the 29 players that have received bids from various clubs, as we see Nanasi and Tokimitsu looking as well. So let's go over the rankings, first 29th to 24th place. In 29th place, we've got Nanasi with a bid of 3 million yen. In 28th place, we've got Wanama with a bid of 4 million yen. In 27th place, we've got Fukaku with a bid of 5 million, and the same goes for Hiragi in 26th. In 25th place, we've got Niu with a bid of 6 million yen. In 24th place, we've got Zantetsu with a bid of 8 million yen. Nanasi is relieved that he's made it. Wanama looks concerned with his 4 million rankings, though. And Zantetsu doesn't understand why his ranking is so low. And now we move on to the top 23 players who are going to be selected to represent Japan in the U-20 World Cup when the Neo Egoist League is over. In 23rd place, we've got Tokimitsu with a bid of 10 million yen, so that means that the coward genius has actually done better than Zantetsu. I hope PXG has resolved his issues. But anyway, in 22nd, we've got Hayate with a bid of 13 million yen. In 21st place, we've got Darai with a bid of 15 million yen. In 20th place, we've got Raichi with a bid of 18 million yen. 
In 19th place, we've got Hiori with a bid of 20 million yen, followed up by Sendao in 18th with the same bid. In 17th place, we've got Otota with a bid of 22 million yen. In 16th place, we've got Karasu with a bid of 24 million yen. In 15th place, we've actually got Shidu with a bid of 25 million yen. In 14th place, we've got Niko Iki with a bid of 30 million yen. In 13th place, we've got Gagamaru with a bid of 32 million yen. And in 12th, we've got Corona with a bid of 24 million yen. Tokamitsu is relieved that he's in, so I don't think the issues are completely resolved with that look on his face. Rechi is very glad with his 18 million bids for his first match. Corona has gone up a bit, and Hiori thinks that 20 million is good for now. And now we get to the most interesting part of it all, the top 11 ranked players. In 11th place, we've got Ryu Jubei with a bid of 35 million yen. In 10th place, we've got Yukimiya Kenyu with a bid of 36 million yen, representing Ajax. In 9th place, we've got Ryo Makaj with a bid of 36 million yen, which has gone down from the previous one because of the embarrassment in the PXG match. In 8th place, we've got Oliver Aiku with a bid of 38 million yen. 7th place goes to Nagise Shiro with a bid of 43 million yen, which has also gone down from last time. Itoshi Rin robbed some of their money, which is quite funny. Ryo has realized it himself as well that their value is lower than last time. Nagi told Ryo that it can't be helped because they were trash today. Ryo tells Nagi that they need to score goals in order to increase their value, so let's switch gears as the egoists are about to go wild in the next game. In sixth place, we've got the dark horse Kunigami Rensuke with a bit of 50 million, which is kind of questionable to say the least. Followed up by our princess Chigiri Hioma in fifth place, with a bid of 50 million as well. Chigiri asks Kunigami to stop tagging along with him as a result. In fourth place, we've gotten Bachira Maguru with a bid of 66 million yen. And now the announcer says that we finally get to the top three. In third place, we've got Baru Shue with a staggering bid of 130 million yen. Although Baru doesn't look too pleased with it as he feels already that Isagi has surpassed him. Which is exactly what happened because in second place tripling his previous value of 50 million yen. We have no other than Isagi Yoichi who has a current value of 150 million yen. He is very pleased with that as you would expect. And the current number one, the superstar who just scores a hat trick in the last match. The genius, Itoshi Sae's younger brother. Itoshi Rin with a bid of 180 million yen. Itoshi Rin truly is always one step ahead of him, surpassing him and always standing in his way. And Michael Kaiser has received a new offer as well. It's from the Spanish giants Real Madrid who has offered Michael Kaiser a bid of a staggering 320 million yen. It's the same club as Itoshi Sei is in as well. The strongest club in the world is prepared to steal Kaiser away from bastard Munchen. And now we get to Ness his pet dog, as he is looking very hyped up because of Kaiser's new bid celebrating his success. He tells Kaiser that right now, he's one step closer to becoming the best striker in the world, and that it was worth placing in the Neo-Egoist League. Ness wonders if Kaiser will become Real Madrid's ace, but Kaiser tells him to shut up and that he's a freaking idiot. Ness doesn't get it, but Kaiser doesn't care about his 320 million bet at all, nor does he care about Real Madrid either because right now he calls himself a trash player who is inferior to Isagi Yoichi as he's scratching his neck. There's no way in hell that Kaiser is going to let it end like this. He will destroy Isagi just like Itoshi Rin is planning to do, but will they succeed is the question at hand here. Isagi tells himself that to the world, he's only worth half as much as Kaiser, and actually even less than that. He couldn't even surpass Itoshi Rin either, so he's only second. So the match against PXG is his last match, and his final chance he's going to get at it to surpass both Itoshi Rin and Michael Kaiser. He's done being the third wheel here to these monsters. So what Asagi wants is the throne in order to get closer to becoming the best player in the world. Despite increasing their value, the top three remain unsatisfied. As the three rivals vow to destroy each other, the stage is set for the epic showdown between the two unbeaten teams, which are PXG and Bastard Munchen. Matches 7 and 8 of the Neo Egoist League matchups are now set. Although Bastard Munchen is sitting this round of matches out, sparks fly as the egoists from the remaining four teams clash against one another. 
Spain is going against France and England is going against Italy. We go to the German stratum as we see the egoists on the training field. They've realized that they are the ones sitting out for this round. Hiori tells them that while the other teams battle each other, we use this time to train and level up, which they would desperately need after seeing Rin's current form. Their final match is going to be against PXG, and after that the Neo Egoist League will end. Their match against PXG is their last chance to show their worth. Gagamaru looks kind of scared after Hiori said that. Reichi doesn't get why his value is lower than Hiori's. Well, maybe that's because he has been one of the leading figures in scoring that final goal. He tells them that he's not pissed at all, though. Hiori tells him that despite what he's saying, he looks oddly satisfied with himself. Corona tells him that he can't hide the fact that he's super hyped that he got an offer. Yukimiya tells Hiori that his assist to Isagi was absolutely sick, and therefore asks him if something has happened. Hiori tells him that he's finally bought into the blue lock mentality. He wants to produce the world's strongest striker. He wants to play football alongside players who can understand his passes. Ever since he's got this mentality, he'll discard an A player who is too stupid to understand his passes. Yukimiya got scared because of Hiori's words and tells him that just now he sounded just like Itoshi Sai. Isagi tells him despite that cool persona, deep down this guy is an ultra sadist. Raichi tells Hiori that he's going to be playing as a playmaker now. Guess that means you're dead as a striker. Hiori doesn't seem to care though as he tells them that at least he's not getting roasted on social media like Isagi. Isagi doesn't understand why it's happening though. So, Hiori shows them some comments from their match against Ubers. One comment says, Isagi Yoichi is the future of Bastard Munchen. And another says that Bastard Munchen's best future front line would be Michael Kaiser and Isagi coexisting together, even though they're still immature and constantly fighting getting in each other's way. If those two manage to understand and sync up with each other, they can potentially become the MSOT lethal striker duo on the face of this planet. Isagi doesn't subscribe to that idea, though, as he starts to completely rage, telling them that there's no possible way that it's ever going to happen. Raichi can't hold his laugh in as he tells Isagi that they've got a point and that those two are good buddies with each other. Isagi tells Raichi to shut up as it's never going to happen. That's so disgusting, he'd rather die than team up with that piece of shit. Hayaway tells Isagi to calm down and that Kaisagi is the trendiest topic on the Blue Lock Twitter page right now. He asks Isagi if he wants to hear more. One comment says that Isagi and Kaiser are the Neo-Egoist League's best couple. But Isagi doesn't buy into any of that as he tells Hiori to shut up and cut it out. Yukimiya looks kind of surprised that he hates that idea so much. But Raichi tells Yukimiya that he's just pretending that he hates Kaiser, but in secret, he's totally in love with him. Corona is going off somewhere else as he's going to do some individual training. Raichi thinks that Corona has got a point as he desires to level up and move up in the rankings more. Hiori tells them that his auction value isn't at a level where he can kick back and relax. If they don't finish in the top 23, all their hard word would have been for nothing. So as a result, they all go off to do their individual training sessions. There's just one more match left. Suddenly, Igaguri walks up to Isagi wanting to talk to him, as Isagi says that all of them have their own goals and objectives. Isagi is willing to listen, telling him what's up. Igaguri tells him that he hasn't played in a match yet, which means that his value is still zero. So he asks Isagi what he needs to do to survive inside of the Neo Egoist League. Isagi looks surprised as Igaguri tells him that if he can't play in the next match, then he's completely finished. Even though he's trying his best, he just can't be able to catch up to the rest of them. He knows that he's got to force his way into the lineup, but everyone keeps getting bigger and bigger offers, which makes it difficult for Igaguri to stand out. So he asks Isagi for advice. But Isagi doesn't really know what to tell him. Igaguri looks very concerned now as a result. Igaguri starts shaking Isagi, asking him to think some more. Isagi wants Igaguri to cut it out as he's thinking around, but he has nothing concrete to give to him. That's why he told that he has nothing. After Igaguri stopped shaking him, he wants Igaguri to recall what his reason for playing football is. So he tells Isagi that it's to avoid taking over his family's temple. Igaguri thinks that kind of reason compared to what Isagi and the rest are aiming to become, which is the best player in the world. 
His reason for playing football is inferior, so he thinks that maybe he needs to change his target to becoming the world's best. But Isagi thinks otherwise telling him that his reason would be enough. He tells Igaguri that he and probably most people can only focus on and pursue achievable realistic short-term goals. Igaguri looks surprised by what Isagi said as Isagi tells Igaguri that he can't compare his goals with other people. Pursuing your goals to the fullest, that's the foundation of their ego, and that ego is unique only to you. He's telling Igaguri that not wanting to take over his family's temple is one heck of an ego he's got there as he tells him to not lose sight of it. This is such a wholesome moment to be honest, it has made my day. Offer Isagi said that he suddenly knows what he has to do now. Isagi looks surprised as he hasn't even told him about his suggestions regarding training and stuff. But Igaguri thinks he's fine and tells him that he'll think about what type of training would work well for him. And thanks Isagi. He tells him when they've met for the first time in that survival game of tag, he never thought he would become a player worth 100 million. He tells Isagi that he's absolutely amazing. Isagi is kind of surprised by Igaguri's attitude. Igaguri tells him that KE knows it because they've started at the bottom two, which are the 300th and 299th place. He hates to admit it, but he's definitely on the path to becoming the best pallier in the world. Igaguri asks Isagi he, he wants some takwan for old times' sake. But Isagi refuses to do that unless he wants that for his natto. But Igaguri passes on that. Now we cut off to the Germany stratum, their blue lock man system field as we see someone hitting the ball hard. It's Kaiser Ibrahimovic who is training his shots there, shooting it into the right upper corner. That new look is very dope on him as he tells himself that he came to the Neo-Egoist League to surpass Noel Noah. And that Bastard Munchen's first team is a squad designed to maximize Noah's strengths. With Noah crowned as the world's strongest forward, the chances of him stealing his spot as Bastard Munchen's ace striker is practically zero. What's why he wanted to use the Neo-Egoist League auction to secure a bigger offer from another club, which would force his way out of Bastard Munchen. He has achieved the first step of his plan, which was through getting an offer from Real Madrid. But there's no way in hell he can go home after losing to Isagi as he fires another shot. Ness looks to him with a concerned look on his face, believing that Kaiser can do it. Even since that day, ever since that moment as he wallowed in that familiar sense of despair, Kaiser has showed up and thought him that there was no such thing as impossible. The next chapter will be a flashback that shows the beginning of their partnership together. Kaiser asked Ness if he believed in the impossible, as Ness was lying down on the ground with the thoughts of giving up in his mind. Ness didn't understand Kaiser, though, as he realized that Ness had the thought of giving up as well. He told Ness that that kind of thinking was a curse, as he called him a stupid scrub. Ness still didn't understand what Kaiser meant to say with that, though, as Kaiser told Ness that the moment people believe things are impossible, they're programmed to give up, which means that it's a useless survival mechanism, but that's a thought process of the weak. While he protects his pathetic pride, he kills the seal of his potential. Sacrificing his talent in exchange for living a long and tedious life isn't worth it in Kaiser's opinion as those are the people he hates the most. Ness looked impressed as Kaiser admitted that his opponents were good after that boastful speech of his. But they're only executing what is possible at a very high level as he doesn't see a truly strong player among them as a result. But he noticed that Ness was different as his dribbling and the timing of his passes were one step ahead of the rest which is why the others couldn't keep up. The only issue was that he didn't have a partner who understood his ideal and could link up with his plays as a result. Kaiser told Ness that with him, all of his ideas would become possible as he encouraged Ness to do this together and reached out his hand. Ness couldn't believe what he had just witnessed as Ness reached his hand back to Kaiser as he accepted his request. This was the birth of Kaiser and Ness as Ness decided to trust Kaiser. The game restarted and Kaiser passed the ball towards Ness, as he told himself that he'd use everything he's got and team up with him like his creativity and magic. He used fast scissors to confuse the opponent as he dribbled past a bastard Munchen player from his left side and moved up the field as he felt Kaiser's timing. Kaiser was moving up on the left side as his aura displayed that he was ready for a ball, 
and Ness reacted to that as a result. Thanks to Kaiser, he's got more options to work with, but they are quickly shutting down his shooting angle as he has nowhere to shoot, but still prepares to take a shot nonetheless, as he shoots his iconic Kaiser impact through three defenders into the net, as he enabled his predator eye and told the bastard Munchen players that they were full of holes as a result. The coach couldn't believe his eyes as Kaiser scored a goal. Ness couldn't believe his eyes either, as that shooting motion was ridiculously fast which meant that he scored the first goal for their team. Kaiser encouraged Ness to continue, as he was aching to get the next one as well. Ness agreed as Kaiser scored his second and third goal. Because of the outstanding performance in this tryout, the scout welcomed Kaiser and Ness to Bastard Munchen as they showed them the impossible. They're at the Bastard Munchen headquarters now, as Ness wondered if Kaiser was going to drink his milk. But Kaiser hates milk, as he couldn't stand any white-colored drinks. While they were training, the coach was furious because they were late, but Kaiser put all the blame on Ness as he apparently didn't wake up even though his hair was all fuzzy, which makes him a fraud. Ness didn't like that comment though, as anyone could see that it was actually Kaiser that overslept here. We go to the showers now as Kaiser has shampoo on his face, which is why he asked Ness to rinse it off from him. Ness told him that it was because he lathered himself with too much soap as he told Kaiser to do it himself. We can clearly see that these two egoists are having a very good time together as Kaiser asked something to Ness while we see hair fall on the ground. Kaiser told him that he was originally a mentally weak person, much to Ness his surprise. He was constantly giving up when he faced things that he believed to be impossible, which is why he has done something specific so that he never falls into that weak mindset again, which is the blue rose tattoo that he has on his neck. A blue rose symbolizes the achievement of the impossible. It was artificially created as the blue color is very unique for roses, and it wasn't initially seen in nature as well, which means that it's an impossibility turned into reality. When Kaiser first saw a blue rose, he saw it as an example of turning the impossible into reality, as it's a sign of defying the natural order of things. Kaiser wants to become someone who can't be defined, which is the impossible, as Ness starts to blush a bit and reckons that it's an awesome goal to have. He enjoyed the fact that Kaiser is opening up to him too, as Kaiser told Ness that he'll win the Champions League and the World Cup as well. And after that, he wants to cast down the rest of the football world into despair, as Ness felt really happy. He reckoned that it sounded like him, as it seemed like he was done with the cut now. Kaiser told him that it was fine, as he just wanted to cut it short, as the long hair was getting in his way. But more importantly, he asked him how the dye was coming in, as that was looking good as well from Ness, his perspective. It's a beautiful shade of blue as Kaiser's dream became Ness his dream as well. We go back to the bastard Munchen Stratum, as Ness acknowledged that the reason he still believed in magic was because of Kaiser. But he noticed that there was something wrong here, as Kaiser was choking himself to death again. Ness runs up to Kaiser as he's very worried that he might kill himself and I would be too. Ness notices that he is deliberately choking himself as he urges him to stop. Kaiser told Ness that he saw it now as he found a way to destroy Isagi Yoichi once and for all and turn the tables with his new weapon. Both of Ness's parents are scientists, as we see this crazy laboratory that his parents work in. It seems that Ness really enjoyed reading fictional books in his free time. Ever since he was a little kid, his parents drilled into him that everyone in the world can be explained through logic. Ness's past is finally revealed in a lonely, isolated world. Just what was the thing that Bastard Munchen's magician desired the most? Ness has gotten a wound on his arm, so he asked his dad if he can heal it with a healing spell. But his dad told him that he must disinfect it quickly. They are standing at the lab as his dad tells him that if they fail to clean the wound, there's a chance that it would get infected and slow down the healing process as a result. In the worst case scenario, he could even die from it. Ness goes to ask his mom if he would die when he becomes affected, but his mom tells him that he won't. If they treat it properly, the chances of him dying are practically 0.01%. So she tells him not to bother them with every little cut and injury and tells him that he must learn how to deal with situations by himself. His little brother and sister think that's pretty stupid as they mess around with sciencey stuff. So the lab is in their home, it seems. Ness asks his big brother and sister if it's possible to summon that monster he sees in the books he's reading to real life. His brother and sister look completely disgusted by it though as they say that he's a dumbass. They've told Ness many times that the monster in a fictional story does not exist and that magic isn't real. They don't like the fact that he's talking about magic and plead him to stop reading books like that. There's no magic in this household. 
Ness goes outside now as he seems to have picked a snowball with a stick. He has made a snowman and a sort of hexagon as he's spouting some crazy witchcrafty words that I do not understand. He asks the snowman to give him strength. But his brother and sister came outside as his brother told him to shut up as his brother grabbed his stick away from him. It's apparently because of him that they can't focus on their experiments. But Ness tells them that he was practicing with magic as he really wanted a pet. His brother is fuming now. His little sister completely destroys the snowman he's made as his brother breaks his stick. He has told Ness many times to stop talking about magic as his sister calls him a good-for-nothing. They go to their parents to tell them what Ness is up to. They don't really know if he's even related to them because of everything that happened. His mom tells them that snow is composed of frozen water crystals, but they also contain dirt particles that were circulating in the air. So he asks them to wash their hands before coming inside. He reiterates that they are scientists and that their duty is to observe, research, and explain natural phenomena. He tells Ness that people who foolishly believe in the impossible are not wanted in his house. This must be very harsh on little Ness as he cries and completely breaks down in the process. He reckons that Ness is at the short end of the pool of genetics, so he's basically trying to say that he's genetically meant to be stupid. His sister says that they've wasted quite a lot of time on Ness and they just want to get back to research. Ness doesn't really care about scientists, though. The only reason they are rejecting magic is that they can't even explain it in a scientific manner. They don't even try to understand the sadness within Ness's heart as he keeps on crying. He truly believes that magic does exist. So when he first read a certain book, he was so excited that he couldn't sleep the entire night. In his head, he was imagining how that kid with the magic wand was fighting against the dragon. None of his family members can explain what he felt in that moment. He was searching for magic every single day. We see Ness being nice to a cat as he says that unlike the rest of his family, he likes dealing with fiction rather than fact. He is staring at the night sky he's now as he says that even imagine. if his family likes to brush off fiction as magic, then he believes that the world is filled with magic and adventure as he's running away from scary dogs. That indescribable feeling and that indescribable sadness. He just can't explain it as it seems that he's walking onto a football stadium. Someone has scored a goal it seems as the stadium and the field look absolutely huge through this perspective. Ness has been completely overwhelmed by this feeling. The players are celebrating as Ness tells himself that football is true magic. With a single goal, a player can ignite the crowd and put the stadium into a frenzy. It can provide a sense of euphoria that transcends all logic. Music He's finally found his place magic. as he thinks that football players are magicians. We now see him playing with the ball and doing cardiovascular activity to improve his stamina. This is what he truly wants to do. He wants to become a football player. His brother still thinks that he's an idiot, and his dad tells them to just forget about him as they reckon that he'd come crying back to them in no time. But Ness has a different plan as we see him dribbling with the ball in a football uniform. He'll show them that he can turn pro and get called to the German national team. The keeper prepares for the show as Ness says that one day. He'll become players that'll entrance the world with his magic as he's shooting the ball towards the goal. He has scored a goal as he's celebrating with his teammates. His teammate tells him that it was a nice goal and that he's, he's invincible in this town. They tell him to hurry up and turn pro as a result of it. We see a scout standing at the sidelines as he tells Ness if he's interested in turning pro so that he could do a tryout for their club. It's the bastard Munchen Academy that is holding those tryouts as well. He's immediately getting into the pinnacle of the Bundesliga. He reckons that the players are huge and look strong. But despite all of that, he's still confident in his abilities. If he shows results in this intra-squad scrimmage, the chances of him receiving a professional contract with Bastard Munchen will skyrocket. His dream of becoming a magician will truly come into fruition as he initiates the kickoff. He dribbles through the middle of two defenders as a teammate of his tries to assert himself telling that he's open while that's actually not really the case. As a result, Ness thinks that he's too slow and that it can't be helped since this is such a makeshift team. He was thinking of passing towards someone but before he could do that, he got tackled by one of his opponents. He doesn't understand that he catches up since he already got past him. 
They score a goal out of that attack, as Ness reckons that these guys are totally different from the players he's used to facing, which makes sense. Ness is trying to press someone with the ball as questions himself if this is the level of those who are seriously trying to turn pro. Even though I can just keep up with them with his technique and creativity, but when it comes to tactics, coordination play, and transition, these guys are on a different planet than him as he's getting frustrated about the situation he finds himself in. His magic world is completely powerless against the world, as the bastard Munchen guys dash ahead while leaving Ness behind. His teammate doesn't really get what he's trying to do and tells him that he's too slow. The other guy tells him to get rid of the ball quicker as a result and calls him a slowpoke. He doesn't like the fact that he is letting them just steal the ball from him time and time again. He hits the ground as he tells himself to shut up and stop. And then he remembers the words of his parents, which were that there's no such thing as magic. And people who foolishly believe in magic are not wanted in this house. He remembers his family calling him a failure now. Ness really hates it as his magic doesn't look effective against those tyrants. But then all of a sudden he meets Michael Kaiser, who was also doing tryouts as he asks Ness if he believes in doing the impossible. As Ness sees his magic getting completely crushed during the bastard Munchen tryouts, he loses the will to fight. As he's laying on the ground, his ego is in complete shambles, and on the verge of despair he looks up to see Michael Kaiser looking over him. How will those two combine forces to join the footballing giant that is Bastard Munchen? We are in the German Stratum's four-man room where we see Yukimiya, Hiori, Corona, and Isagi. Corona starts by telling them that if his math is correct, scoring a goal is worth between 30 and 50 million. The reason he's saying this is because Isagi had gained 100 million through scoring two goals, I'm assuming. By scouting out their rivals, the players understand the trends behind the Neo Egoist League auction. Conquer the chaos on the field, mass produce goals and become king of the Neo Egoist League. Yukimiya agrees with Corona as he reiterates the point I've been making earlier. He tells him that even if they take other factors like chances created into account, it would probably add up to that amount anyway. Hiori agreed as he got valued at 20 million thanks to his assistance. So your value increases if you contribute to scoring goals cause that's what football is fundamentally about, after all. Corona is convinced that he will put on a show in the next match, as the only thing on his mind right now is survival. But Hiori wants to be the star, and Yukimiya starts getting hyped up too, as he's tired of people calling him a mud boat. Isagi is staring at the screen looking at Rin's value as he acknowledges that the difference between Rin's value and his is 30 million and the gap will widen after PXG's match against FC Barca. Isagi wonders if this means that if they beat PXG and Isagi outscores Rin, he can overtake him in the rankings. The title of Blue Lock's number one player is literally right in front of him. He wants to defeat and surpass him. He wants to see the scenery from the top, looking down on the pile of strikers that he has crushed and have crumbled. Yukimiya reckons it's about time for them to go as PXG's match against FC Barcha is about to start. The egoists are in the monitor room now as we can see the match being displayed on a big screen. Raichi reckons that it's time to scout out the enemy team now as Gagamaru wonders just what kind of team PXG is. To win and become number one, Isagi needs to analyze Rin and PXG carefully. The game is kicked off as Charles passes the ball to Rin. PXG's formation has gotten exposed to us as well, which is a 3-3-2-1-1. Isagi notices that Rin is playing as a lone striker and that Shidu is starting on the bench. Otoya and Bachira want to get into the fun now as well. It's a two versus one situation against Rin, but he still has two players behind him that can assist him, which are Tokimitsu and Nanasi. Isagi noticed that they're providing Rin with support while simultaneously creating a 3v2 situation, so naturally they'd be good. Rin passes the ball to Nanasi, and Nanasi passes the ball to Tokimitsu, as Bachira is close behind him. Tokimitsu passes the ball behind Rin towards Charles. He crosses the ball in towards Rin from a very high trajectory, which probably means that it has some backspin to it so that it can land at Rin's feet seamlessly. And that's exactly what happens, but he's getting pressed by two of the FC Barcha players as well. He's in range as Isagi anticipated Rin's trump card incoming, which is his trademark highly accurate curve shot. He gave the ball a good hit as it curved towards the left upper corner. It seems as if the goalkeeper can't reach it. 
and he couldn't indeed as Rin scored through a devilish spinning mid-range shot. The Blue Lockers look pretty surprised about the perfectionism that his shot just now represents, as Isagi reckons that through adding different spins to his shot, his scoring options have increased drastically. This is the new Itoshi Rin. We see Julian Loki now as he's requesting a substitution change. Karasu and Zantetsu knew that they were given the task immediately, so they put off their jackets in response. Raichi doesn't understand it, though. Well, their reason for doing that is because they're pulling Rin out and Shidu in. But this also requires a different team dynamic, so Karasu Tabito and Tsurugi Zantetsu have been put in as well. The game restarts as we see PXG's formation taking a shift. It's a 3-3-3-1 this time, I believe, and Isagi has noticed that the team is using an entirely different system as well compared to when Rin was on the field. Karasu got the ball off Otoya through a sliding as he passed the ball to Zantetsu, and Zantetsu dashes ahead in response. Unlike before, the PXG team is playing a very counter-attacking style. They immediately go on the counter once they gain possession as Zantetsu passes the ball to Charles. And Charles curves the ball beautifully and skillfully towards Shidu Ryusei. PXG's entire team is focused on setting up Shidu to score. However, Gagamaru doesn't think that that high arching pass will cut it as it's too fast. So he doesn't think that Shidu will get it as he starts speaking in emoji language all of a sudden. But if we can forget that happened for a second, Shidu Ryusei has scored the second goal for PXG. The demon himself has reincarnated. Even if Shidu is a bad shot taker according to Asagi, he still managed to score a goal from such a difficult angle. Yukimiya reckons that he's a freak, and Raichi thinks it's bullcrap, as he reckons that there's no way to game plan against that. But either way, Gagamaru understands that this team relies heavily on the striker's talents to score. A Rin-centered system and a Shidu-centered system. And above all, a dangerous team with two distinct styles in which they can win with. Raichi is starting to get impatient as he asks them what they should do. He doesn't get how they're supposed to have a game plan against a team like that. But Isagi and Hiori have quickly picked up that that pass just now was completely intentional. That guy knew Shido's tendencies and intentionally sent that pass as a result. The others don't really get their thought process, though, which makes sense. Isagi also acknowledges that his assist to Rin was pretty good, as he delivered a pinpoint pass with some backspin to it, so that Rin had more scoring options, which I had realized as well. Hiori continues by stating that he not only had a good understanding of Shidu's instinctive playstyle, but he can also sync and match up with Rin's vision and playmaking, which means he is no ordinary guy. The reason why PXG can win with two polar opposite playing styles is because of the beautiful passes that Charles dishes out. And his full name is Charles Chevalier, the heart of PXG. PXG's strength is a double standard system that maximizes the strengths of their two strikers, Rin and Shidu. As the two steal all the attention, who is the skilled maestro playing behind them that brings the best out of these polar opposite strikers? The score is 1-2 as we go to the match Manshine City versus Ubers, where we see AGI trapping the ball with his chest in between Drago and Perone, while PXG is flexing its firepower at the same time in another part of Blue Lock, Ubers, and Manshine City exchange blows. As the chaos emanates from the two battlegrounds, who will become the game's protagonist and score the winning goal? Chris urges AGI to pass to Nagi Seishiro much to Aji's dismay. So he passed to the protege Nagi Seishiro while he was being pressed hard. Nagi Seishiro traps the ball in elegant fashion like usual. Nico warns Aryu that the ball is coming. So they are preparing for his arrival now. Nagi Seishiro looks very confident as he's running towards the egoists. He taps the ball over Nico's head and roulettes past him while tapping the ball perfectly. But now, of course, ace eater Don Lorenzo is trying to get in his way. Lorenzo tells Nagi that he's not the only one who's special inside the Neo Egoist League. In Ubers, their team that would of course be Baru Shuei, and in Manshine City, I'd argue that it's Chigiri since he's the only one who managed to score against PXG. Nagi freezes up the moment he comes face to face against Don Lorenzo, but Ryo urges Nagi to shoot right now. He doesn't want Nagi to hesitate, he just wants him to focus on the goal. And that's exactly what he does while being hard-pressed at the same time. But Aiku manages to clear the ball as he reckons that Nagi is too slow, which is very true. Because Nagi freezing up probably cost him a couple of seconds. And the fact that Nagi is hesitating is very odd. 
as well as it doesn't look like the prodigy's mind is occupied with football at all. He really needs to come back to his senses, otherwise all he's going to gain is the drive back home. It just feels like he has lost confidence in his abilities after he lost against PXG, which is a shame. Back to the present moment, Aiku asks him if this is really all he has got as he wonders where that passion he showed for football went when he faced Isagi. The only reason why Nagi was fired up back then is because he really wanted to crush Isagi Yoichi. Now that he doesn't have a clear goal, he's clearly lost. Ryo tries to put goals on him, but that's not working either. Nagi needs to regain his passion through a goal that makes him want to get out of bed and conquer the field. Lorenzo compliments Aiku for that block, as he reckons that it's worth 80 million yen. And Nagi is frustrated as you'd expect. Now Barushue makes his grand entrance as he gets the loose ball and barges up the field. We see Ryo being frustrated as well as Baru tells them to get out of his way as that last goal is his. So he casually chop dribbles past a couple of Manshine City players. Ryo tries to tackle him but it's of no use as he passes the ball towards Nico and Nico proceeds to pass the ball back towards Baru. Baru is literally in front of the goal now, one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper, as he activates Predator Eye ready to take a shot. He takes the shot, but Chigiri Hioma saves it as the ball is loose again at a pretty high altitude. Baru could not believe what he'd just witnessed as Chigiri was really looking cold on this panel. But then he proceeds to say something ridiculous that completely ruins the moment. It seems that the loose ball went towards Sendo, as he was tightly marked by two of the Manshine City players. But he went for a shot anyway and scored the winning goal for Ubers. Baru is still frustrated about Chigiri, as Chigiri looks to be very frustrated too now. Aiku is relieved and seems to be really happy for Sendao, and that makes sense since they were teammates in the former U20 team. Sendao is celebrating now with Aiku holding him tight. With that goal, match eight of the Neo Egoist League is over. The Ubers guys have won the game one to three. Nagi is looking very exhausted. It looks like someone is about to go even lower in his ranking than before. Ryo is feeling empathetic towards Nagi as AGI tells them that those two won't be able to level up anymore the way they are. AGI tells them that the next match is their last chance to prove themselves. He tells him something really interesting now, which is that before they'd both become insignificant randoms, he wants Ryo to break up his partnership with Nagi. I can actually make sense of AGI here as they're relying on each other to make plays. They are becoming too predictable on the field because they're always seeking out each other. But Ryo tells AGI to shut up and leave him alone as he doesn't like the fact that he's meddling with his business. However, AGI continues by stating that Ryo is too codependent. If he genuinely wished to become stronger and grow to evolve into a world-class player, Sometimes it's necessary to have the guts to cast aside those precious to you exactly the way Nagi did when he wanted to play with Asagi instead of Ryo to make sure that he's improving at a rapid rate. Yet he has never abandoned his promise to Ryo. Imagine if Ryo goes rouge and awakens his ego to new lengths. Nagi fans would be crying at that point. But it's possible that the pain and suffering he went through because of Nagi might still linger in the back of his mind. Nagi goes up to Baru now as he asks him what his goal is just like he did with Itoshi Rin. He asks him what drives him, which results in him playing football so intensely. Baru is confused as he tells Nagi that he obviously wants to become the best player in the world. He's always had a huge ego. The good thing about Baru is the fact that after he had Isagi as his goal, he immediately switched course and is sticking to it now, while Nagi is completely clueless. So just like he did with Itoshi Rin, he asks Baru what happens after he reaches his desired outcome. Baru tells him that he will define an era of football as its king and destroy all those who dare to challenge him for his throne. This kind of ambitious ego is the thing that drives Baru Shue to strive towards greatness all day every day. Nagi understands as he realizes that Baru wants to become the king of the football world. Baru doesn't look too pleased as he asks him what's up with those half-assed, weak-willed questions all of a sudden. Another thing that he has noticed is that Nagi is not even annoying, so he asks him what's up with that. But Nagi obviously doesn't have an answer. He wouldn't ask questions like that to Baru and Rin otherwise. Wise. Baru explains that it feels like his hunger to become stronger is gone. He can't even feel his usual pain-in-the-ass competitiveness anymore. All Baru sees now is a loser pretending to fight 
because he's lost his edge. Nagi really isn't playing football for himself anymore. Honestly, the time when he cast aside Ryo to move towards his objective was the best moment in his character development and in his development as a player as well, keeping a close look and playing alongside Isagi to use that against him down the line. After he made that goal against Bastard Munchen, he has indeed lost that edge because he felt accomplished even though Manshine City didn't end up winning that match. Nobody can help him with this internal problem of his. Ryo is just making sure that he'll never reach his potential subconsciously, and if Chris Prince could do something about it, he would have taken the necessary action by now, don't you think? This really is something that has to come from himself, as he needs to identify what he's playing football for so that he can get back that heat that Baru is talking about. Baru tells him to go hit rock bottom, despair, and die as he calls him a wimp. And I kind of agree with Baru here, to be honest. And after this, he says something really interesting as well. He tells Nagi that unless he does some serious soul-searching with that half-assed ego, he wouldn't stand a chance on the world stage confirming my hypothesis about Nagi Seishiro that I've discussed at length in my recent Nagi theory. We move to PXG versus FC Barcha now, as Shidu scored the winning goal for PXG through a header, as the match concludes with a score of 3-2. Something funny to note here is that FC Barcha got closer to beating PXG than any other team within the Neo Egoist League so far, excluding Bastard Munchen, which probably means that they're in better shape before going into their final match against Manshine City. Raichi seems to be really enjoying himself by watching Shidu go crazy as we move to the Germany Stratum's monitor. Room. Gagamaru says that it's an acrobatic diving header. Hiori says that even though Lavigno came on, and together with Otoya, they helped get the most out of Bachira. It wasn't enough in the end thanks to Shidu's winning goal. So this literally means that Loki didn't even substitute in for PXG. They've done all of this without their master, which should scare Bastard Munchen a little bit, to be honest. Isagi says that with that, they and PXG are the only teams who are still undefeated. This means that the match against PXG will be an all-out battle to determine the champion of the Neo Egoist League as Shidu is making a goofy pose. Shidu's acrobatic header helps PXG get a win against the Spanish Giants FC Barcha. As the showdown between the two undefeated teams draws even closer, the Egoist's blood begins to boil in anticipation. Isagi gets really hyped as he says that the stage is set for the best. Blue Lock. Chapter 246, Irregular Abnormal, A Secret Training for Two. Overcome this adversity and prove your own worth. In the German Stratum's training field, we see Igaguri and Kiora practicing together. Kiora rushed towards Igaguri and Igaguri fell down. It's so nice that we get to see a bit more of Kiora Jin. I'm really excited to see what he is going to bring to the table in their match against PXG, since Noel Noah has confirmed him that he'd be playing in the upcoming match. Igaguri insists Kiora to go at it one more time as Noel Noah is watching them on from a distance. In the Germany Stratum's monitor room, the rest of the blue lockers are there to see the latest rankings. The announcer is about to reveal the salary bid rankings updated from the 7th and 8th matches. Yukimiya says that it's the final match for the Italy team. Gagamaru confirms that they are getting their last salary evaluations, which pretty much means that Isagi is going to be above Baru for sure after their match against PXG has finished. Isagi is realizing that this is the latest ranking that he must surpass. The announcer says that there are 35 players currently in the bidding, but to be a U20 Japan representative, you need to be within the top 23. The top 23 players and their bids are as follows. Raichi is 23rd with a bid of 18 million yen. Hiori is 22nd with a bid of 20 million yen. Zantetsu is 21st with a bid of 23 million yen. Tokimitsu is 20th with a bid of 23 million yen. Fukaku is 19th with a bid of 28 million yen. Gagamaru is 18th with a bid of 32 million yen. Corona is 17th with a bid of 34 million yen. Ryo is 16th with a bid of 34 million yen. Karasu is 15th with a bid of 35 million yen. Yukimiya is 14th with a bid of 36 million yen. Sendu is 13th with a bid of 37 million yen. Nico is 12th with a bid of 40 million yen. Nagi is 11th with a bid of 40 million yen. Otoya is 10th with a bid of 42 million yen. Aryu is 9th with a bid of 45 million yen. Kunigami is 8th with a bid of 50 million yen. Chigiri is 7th with a bid of 55 million yen. Aiku is 6th with a bid of 60 million yen. Bachira is 5th with a bid of 79 million yen.
In fourth place, we've got Shidu with 100 million yen, which is rightfully deserved as well. Baru is third with a bid of 150 million yen, as he's tied with Isagi right now, but that's probably going to change. And then we've, of course, got Itoshi Rin with a bid of 198 million yen. Sendao was happy making it into the top 13, which is a byproduct of his goal against Manshine City as Nanaiz fell short at 24th place, although he still has the opportunity to get within the top 23. Raichi made it to the top 23, but just barely. Meanwhile, Nagi and Ryo are in the top 11 and top 16, respectively. Nagi realized that it was dropping, as Ryo told Nagi that if they stayed like this, they definitely needed to change something. Ryo is totally right, because if they don't, it could quite literally mean their end. Nagi should take Baru's words into consideration. Shidu looks to be happy with his 100 million bid as he realizes that number one is within range. Baru doesn't like the fact that they're tied at 150 million, though, as he calls him a loser. And of course, Rin went up again as he's very close to 200 million. It's of no surprise, really. But all of a sudden, Noel Noah entered the monitor room. He told the egoists that the conditions are set. Whether they stand on the border, aim for a comeback, or go for number one, the goal for the team is one. He wants the egoists to show their ability calmly and rationally in order to seize victory. They are about to hold a strategy meeting for the final game. We move to PXG their locker room now, as Loki tells the egoists that they've done a good job. PXG is a singularity. Loki will tell them their points to improve like he always does. From this interaction, it looks like Loki is way more direct with his teachings than Noel Noah is. Loki reckons that three shots on target out of four are good but he asks Rin to increase the number of his shots a little. And for Shidu, he shot too much with 12 shots and only three of them were on target. So he tells him to try and raise his range a bit and improve his accuracy. He tells Karasu that he needs to improve the win rate of his duels. Zantetsu has to increase how many times he sprints. Tokamitsu needs to enhance his coordination with the back line. And Nanasi simply needs to polish his ball touch technique. Loki is much more direct than any other master. The only master that comes remotely close is Manshine City's Chris Prince. Do you want some anime drip on you? Then I've got good news for you. Fandomian is a website that sells blue lock merch around the globe like sweaters, t-shirts, and even backpacks. They also sell merch from other anime and manga as well. If you use code Senshi at purchase, you will receive a 10% discount. Loki is still talking, but Charles had different ideas as he was slowly leaving the room, so Loki kicks a ball at him. Loki tells Charles that he hasn't given him his homework yet, as Charles doesn't like the fact that his meetings are always so long. Charles reckons that it's fine to be more casual, like Master Striker Lavinio. Loki tells Charles that he has joined the Neo-Egoist League to nurture him. Well, now we finally learned Loki's intentions. It's about time. Loki needs a passer to lead him to the top, much like she do. And Loki recognized his talent. Although Charles Chevalier is 15, which means that he is two years younger than Loki. He's here to study for the future of France, and Loki wants him to become the best with him. Man, he's putting all these expectations on him. This kind of feels like a Hiori moment. Charles covered his ears and told Tokimitsu to let him know when he was done. Loki tells Charles that he still lacks a lot of experience as he came here to study. Charles really doesn't enjoy it, though, as Loki asks him how long he's planning to be so careless. Charles responds by saying that he doesn't want to do what he's told, which makes a lot of sense. Loki tells him that he doesn't have to listen to him anymore, which ironically makes him listen. Stop the cow! <laughs> if Loki took that approach from the start and didn't force him or put expectations on him, perhaps he would have taken everything in way better than he is right now. This way of forcing beliefs and intentions on another person is not right from an ethical point of view. Loki tells everyone that PXG has been experimenting with two systems, the Rin-centered and the Shidu-centered system striving to pass to two strikers with special personalities. It was an experiment to bring out Charles's abilities. And yet I was thinking that he was actually trying to make Shidu feel well and give him a place. But no, of course, he has some other hidden intentions behind it. But on the other hand, it kind of makes sense since they're still going to be rivals in the U-20 World Cup and the actual World Cup as well, since Loki is around their age. But the other master strikers would have no intentions of doing things like that. The other members adapted to it, as they were choosing a path that appealed to their own existence. This way, their individual levels have also improved. But in the final match, they will face Bastard Munchen, which is led by Noel Noah, who is the world's number one striker. They are a team that is undefeated like them, 
Moreover, their formation is a lot like PXG's, coexisting and competing two systems which are the Michael Kaiser and Isagi Yoichi centric systems, an irregular and abnormal team. In their case, they've been changing Rin and Shadu every 15 minutes of the match and making member changes. But the abnormal one is more interesting. This means that they will face Bastard Munchen with PXG's irregular and abnormal formation with Rin and Shidu as their double aces. I wonder if they will get along unlike the third selection I can't wait for the match. Shidu looks to be pretty positive about it though, as he is excited about the fact that it'll be a four-way monster battle. Itoshi Rin seems positive about it as well. An all-out brawl with no restrictions. Loki tells the egoists that this is a maximum difficulty level mission. So he urges them to use the two beasts which are Itoshi Rin and Shidu Ryusei. To win against Bastard Munchen, this is their last piece of homework. Charles tells Loki that he doesn't hear him now. Ryo is looking on Twitter as they've commented mean things about Nagi and him. Nagi and Mikaj are dragging their feet too much. No wonder their salaries are down. Super goal by the one-hit wonder Nagi Seishiro. Nagi and Ryo's salaries went down so much. Could this be bad? Do something, Chris Prince. Stop sitting on the bench and make a new team. Nagi is the one-hit wonder. This is win or bust Nagi. That super goal must have been a fluke. What the hell are these guys doing? Rio is reading those tweets with a sad look on his face, and rightfully so, they need to get their stuff back together. He asks Nagi if they could talk for a second as they're in the England locker room. Nagi wants to talk to Rio as Rio tells him that now he's down to 16th place with 34 million, it's starting to feel really dicey. With the cutoff point at 23rd with 18 million yen. If Rio keeps performing like this in the next match, he might not make the cut indeed. He needs to at least try to play on par with their game against Bastard Munchen if he wants a bit anywhere near where he started. He doesn't necessarily have to make a super goal, but he should at least be capable of proving his worth through scoring goals. But Nagi is still in the safe zone with a bit of 40 million yen. If they mess up the next game as well and go down again, they could end up at 24th or lower, which is the real danger zone. They need to put up results in the final round. They have to keep going. Nagi interrupts him as he agrees with Ryo, because apparently he was thinking the same thing. Ryo is kind of confused right now. Nagi's drive might be back right now, as he's at least thinking straight, which is a big step forward for Nagi. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be worthwhile for him to go around asking Itoshi Rin and Baru Shue what their reason for playing football is. Nagi told Ryo that they need to change, as he's been feeling a bit off ever since they won the first round. We see some more tweets now. Doesn't Nagi look like someone who only starts? when surrounded by amateurs? The geniuses disappeared, and they really did. Their talents didn't wither, as Chris Prince likes to say it, but their hunger for football was the thing that withered. It could only be regained through their originality. FC Barcha is doing pretty well considering they only lost three, two against the dominant PXG, so it isn't like Nagi and Rio are going to have an easy time against them. But Chira should be continuing to evolve as well, as I don't see anything going out of hand with that ego of his. Nagi can't seem to get that drive to come back like Baru noticed when he was playing against him. He wasn't even annoying anymore like he used to be, very pathetic indeed. Attaining success above his talent level really has hurt him a lot. Nagi has been feeling lost. We see some more tweets now, and these are encouraging. I believe in you. Nagi Seishiro will survive. Nagi is back. What a wonderful goal once again. Good luck, Nagi Seishiro. But the moment didn't wait for Nagi and his enemies were getting further and further ahead. Baru Shue, Itoshi Rin, and Isagi Yoichi seem to be too far ahead for the egoist who lost his ways. They all know their originality and have a very strong reason and foundation for their egos. Nagi is realizing that if they don't keep changing, they will never reach the world's number one spot. So he tells Ryo to change as he wants to get some new heat. Ryo agrees as he tells Nagi that he has an idea. I'm excited to see what Ryo will come up with for their final match against FC Barcha. We go to the Germany team monitor room as Noah tells the egoists that they'll go with a style that has a number of options. Based on this basic form of offense and defense, that's their strategy. It seems like they're still going to rock the same formation, which is a 4-4-2. We can't get enough of Noah's rationality. If you have good numbers and know how to do basic offense and defense, you win if your numbers are higher than the opposition. But is that really the case here, though, since PXG is a very strong and competent team? You have Itoshi Rin, Shidu Ryusei, Charles Chevalier, and more, who are led by Julian Loki. Furthermore, 
PXG is undefeated as well, so basic offense and defense might not cut it here. Let me say this. Noel Noah continues. Whoever comes in second will not be remembered. This statement can be proven when I ask you guys this question. Who is the second fastest man in the world? Exactly, you don't know. But everyone knows Usain Bolt, right? That's just how the world of sports operates. This is also something that Kunigami should have paid attention to before he decided that he wanted to become a hero. If you're not number one, they won't leave their mark on this world. Itoshi Sai is going to whip Isagi if he loses this one. If you're enjoying this video so far, consider subscribing. Noel Noah says that they will win this and make their marks in history. Isagi seems to be very excited right now. Noel Noah is going to head to bed right now as he's going to pass the spotlight to a special guest. And that man is no other than Ego Jinpachi, as Noah tells the dictator to go ahead only for Ego to tell him to shut up. Bro has no mercy with the way he speaks to the world's best striker. Ego tells him to get the hell out and go to bed as he calls him a bastard. Noel Noah agrees and tells him goodnight. Can someone tell me why he is so nice to Ego Jinpachi? patchy but very intimidating towards Michael Kaiser, while Kaiser treats Noah very nicely and Ego treats Noah like a piece of dirt? Where is that Ego of his at right now? Why is he so tolerant of Ego's presence and language? Yukimiya looks to be a bit confused by Ego Jinpachi's arrival in physical form as he greets them with the iconic diamonds in the rough as he wants to personally say a few things before the final round starts. Ego Jinpachi is about to cook as the time is ticking for the final battle. Every time the man has to say something, it's always something very important, so this better be worth my time as well. The first thing he wanted to mention was the key he gave them to win. Igaguri was confused as Hiori recalled that it was the proof of originality. If we go back to chapter 153, we can see that that's what the road to becoming a professional was meant for. They must accurately visualize what they want to become and choose the best environment for themselves. For better or worse, this choice is guaranteed to completely derail their lives. And Hiori was right. Ego is stating that they're hitting the barrier of the real world. As the egoists continue to fight through the salary bidding system, he has a very important question to ask them. Just what does originality mean to them? Isagi is confused as Ego asks if it's their own personal playstyle. Or maybe it's how much money they're worth. No, those are just superficial answers. Superficial answers wouldn't get you anywhere in the world of sports unless your desires are less than becoming the world's best. The prime example is Itoshi Sei catching a case on Sendao Shuto. Originality equals hunger. You weren't born with it. It wasn't taught to you. He asks them what they hunger for. This is what makes a person's originality. For example, Baru Shue's originality is becoming the king of the football world and crushing everyone in his path. Rin's hunger is surpassing Itoshi Sai and destroying Isagi Yoichi. Shidu's hunger is proving his existence through scoring goals as he gets a dopamine rush from it every time. For Isagi, I'd imagine it's to become the world's best striker and lead Japan to victory in the World Cup. In order for them to win so far in the Neo Egoist League, they had to rationally commit to a required role. They must follow their own ideals and voluntarily destroy and recreate themselves over and over again. They've been forced to ask what they want to be. Blue Lock is this kind of twisted place after all. You get confronted with your darkest desires or lack thereof, but this kind of self-reflection could help them a lot in the professional world. Those who cannot explain their ideal are second-rate strikers. This doesn't only go for how they want to play, but their belief systems as well. Do they want to be a regular like Gurumu Igaguri? Do they want to desperately survive like Raichi Jingo? Do they want to beat that guy's meat? Do they want to become number one like Isagi Yoichi? The hunger that has been revealed here is now their originality. This is precisely what Nagi has to do to ultimately succeed in the Neo Egoist League as well. The world is waiting for that challenging focus of theirs, the radiance of a footballer. I wonder if this is foreshadowing that the final match will be held in the U-20 stadium and be a full 90 minutes long. That would be sick, it would surpass the U-20 match, and we get to indulge in it some more before we head to the U-20 World Cup arc. The ones that keep fighting through this crazy, continuous frenzy. Ego Jinpachi calls them professionals. So his question to the egoists is if they are ready to shine. 
We see a shot from above of the Blue Lock facility as the announcer shows his gratitude to every Blue Lock fan tuning in worldwide. He tells them to get ready as the moment we've all been waiting for is upon us, which is the climax of the Neo-Egoist League. The entire footballing world waits as the audience tunes in to the final matches of the Neo-Egoist League. Will we see the moment? The moment a legend is born? Tonight's matches are FC Barcha versus Manshine City and the Battle of the Undefeated, which is Bastard Munchen versus PXG. We see a lot of familiar faces tuning in like Isagi, their parents, and Chigiri's sister, I think. Maybe that the other one is Tokamitsu's brother and we see some more people tuning in that I don't know about. One thing that sticks out to me, though, is the fact that people are drinking at a bar with the game on the big screen, who will emerge as the neo-egoist champion as the seconds tick down to the kickoff. We go to FIFA's conference room now as we see Buratsuda having a sinister smile on his face as he shows the tablet, which has growing numbers. He asks them what they think about the ratings because they are off the charts. Blue Lock Television now has over 100 million subscribers worldwide, which is insane. It is one of the biggest and hottest sports entertainment platforms on the planet. The entire football world is tuning in to witness the emergence of its newest superstar. He tells the people that they must take full advantage of the immense popularity wave that Blue Lock Television has generated. That's why, regarding the upcoming U-20 World Cup, Hirotoshi Buratsuda humbly asks them to consider his ideas. We see the FIFA president now now, as Buratsuda begs him to take his idea into consideration, he tells him that he'll consider it if it increases their revenue. We are in the Blue Lock Medical Checkroom now as we see a lot of stats on display, as well as ratings, it seems, and some other graphics and numbers. Cardiopulmonary function, muscle mass, overall fitness. Henri says that his numbers are slowly but surely reaching Noel Noah's numbers, and I'm pretty sure that she's talking about Kunigami here. She proceeds to say that achieving these numbers at his age is astounding. But why is there some weird cubicle thing with wires like they've got in the Matrix movie that scares the freak out of me. Jinpachi Ego tells her to not forget that it's a test subject since he is the man who came out of the wild card. He was designed to raise the level of the rest of the unpolished gems in his quest to create the world's best. Now I get that, but Kunigami hasn't been able to accomplish that so far even though his stats should be reflecting his competence as a player. We see Kunigami wired up now as Jinpachi tells Kunigami to throw away his ego and achieve a blank state of mind. Doesn't this literally mean that he should be an NPC, though, as Kunigami agrees? We are in the Germany Stratum's locker room now as they'll go with the 442 formation like usual. We've got Kaiser and Kunigami up front. I get Kaiser, but I think putting Kunigami in the front wouldn't be that smart because of his performance in the previous match against the Ubers team. But it might just be that Jinpachi went up to Noel Noah to give him a piece of his mind about why this match would be different. This also means that he will be in the same position as Shidu, since I'm assuming that he's going to be a center forward as well, together with Itoshi Rin. I really hope we get some backstory about Kunigami here. On right wing, we've got Isagi. I hoped that he'd play in the center forward position instead of Kunigami, since he definitely was the most valuable player in their match against Ubers, and Isagi told the interviewer that he wants to make it as a striker. Hence why I find this decision a bit strange, but Isagi would actually be a very competent midfielder because of his vision and playmaking skills. Grimm is on the left wing, no surprises there. Ness is a center attacking midfielder, of course, since he's going to assert Kaiser and help him with his goals and help him to completely demolish Isagi Yoichi. Reichi is a center defensive midfielder, just like the last game as well. He did pretty well there, considering that he literally gave Snuffy a hard time with his grit and stamina. The protractor mode was quite a success, but there just were some variables that Isagi didn't anticipate. Hiori is in the right back spot. To be honest, I would much rather have him in a center attacking midfielder than Ness since Asagi as Hiori carried Bastard Munchen towards victory. But this is fine, since he's on the same lane as Asagi, although I don't think that he can fully shine in that position. On the right-back spot, we have Kiora Jin. Honestly, we know so little about the guy, but I'm excited to see what he is made of. And then, we of course have Birkenstock and Mensa on the center-back spots. Makes a lot of sense that they're both from Bastard Munchen, since Blue Lock is made out of strikers. And Goat Maru is on goal, of course. Noel Noah proceeds to tell them that he plans on aggressively substituting substituting players, depending on the situation, though. He's going to be way more conscious of his decisions than ever before, as he should. He wants to see the full extent of this team's ability, so he asks those on the bench to be ready to fight at a moment's notice, as he urges them to not miss their opportunity. Noel Noah asks them to go out and win now, as he won't accept any less. We see the bastard Munchen guys walking up towards the pitch as Igaguri gets hyped as he agrees with No, even though he isn't playing. Gagamaru and Reichi are getting hyped now as well. 
Winning is going to be the only thing that matters here as he looks back to his early days in the Neo-Egoist League where he provided assists and even used himself as a decoy. Bit by bit, he overcame the obstacles standing in his way. And as he fought, he evolved and gained new weapons. Maybe that's why the current Isagi can think about becoming the world's best striker. Becoming the best player in the world was always a vague and obscure desire. But now he can already visualize the way he wants to play as a striker as we see a puzzle piece with the lefty shot. Talking about the lefty shot, I'm sad that Kaneshiro has kept out Isagi's training since he probably wants to save it for the match. I wonder if it genuinely is that easy for Kaiser to take him down since Isagi has trained a lot. We see more puzzle pieces now like Metavision from the third selection, Egocentricism from his match against Manshine City, number one from the mindset he gained throughout his time in the bastard Munchen stratum, which also is his originality and flow like he's realized in the U-20 arc. These are the ways he will defeat Rin and carry bastard Munchen to victory. But will it really be that easy facing against an evolved Rin and a hungry Shidu? The image of becoming the best player in the world, this is Isagi Yoichi's originality indeed as this is the only thing that he desires. This is Isagi Yoichi's hunger. We get to the field now as the PXG players are ready for battle. Their formation is a 3-4-1-2 with Shidu Ryusei and Itoshi Rin as center forwards, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Although I wonder how those two will actually play with each other without fighting as gruesomely as we've seen in the third selection. Zenetsu is right wing and can assert himself pretty well there through his sprints. Charles Chevalier is a center attacking midfielder as he has been the key to Shidu and Rin their goals. Nanasi is left wing. I wonder what he's going to bring to the table. Karasu Tabito is a center midfielder together with Tokimitsu. Tokimitsu is obviously there because of his raw strength and Karasu is there because of his observational skills and tenacity on the ball. Michelin is right back. Gabon is the center back and Chapa is left back. I wonder how big of a role he will play in this match, since a lot of people within the Blue Lock community speculated that he is a next-gen 11 and Renoir is on goal. Shidu Ryusei says hi to the Blue Rose Emperor Michael Kaiser as he wonders if the whole world will know his name if he beats him. Kaiser tells him to get lost as he calls him a vulgar pink-haired philistine. Shido reckoned that this is going to be a lot of fun. Isagi walks up to Itoshi Rin and tells him to put the title of number one on the line to see who's the strongest out of them once and for all. Itoshi Rin doesn't give a crap about that, though, as there is a different thing that he desires the most. And that thing is the moment he destroys him as they bang heads ready to take each other on. Karasu asks them to wrap it up as the show is about to start. Nanais reckons that this is all or nothing as he's about to put his life on the line here. Raichi wants to win, destroy, and survive, as Gagamaru calls them champions. We see a shot of Kunigami and the ball now as Isagi reckons that it's his challenge and goal. He will surpass Itoshi Rin in this match as Game 10 of the Neo Egoist League officially started. Winning is the only thing that matters as the Neo Egoist League title is on the line. Sparks fly as the two teams glare at each other across their respective halves. Bastard Munchen versus PXG, the Munch-anticipated title match kicks off.